This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Donald Hoffman. He's a cognitive scientist at UC Irvine, also the recipient of the Trolland Award of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. I found Donald through this great article in The Atlantic and his fantastic TED Talk. Don studies how our visual perception, guided by millions of years of natural selection, authors every aspect of our everyday reality. His research is about uncovering the underlying secrets of human perception. He's discovered many clues that point to our very subjective nature of reality. The way Don sees it, we actively create everything we see, and there is no aspect of reality that does not depend on consciousness. This is one of those conversations where I am out of my element. It might not feel that way to you, but when you go take a look after this conversation, when you go take a look at some of Don's writings, his TED Talk, imagine if you put yourself in my shoes to conduct this interview. Great stuff. I am so fortunate to have such great guests on this show. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Donald Hoffman. And I want to hear the backstory of this and how this came to be. As a teenager, you're pondering whether or not we, us homo sapiens, are robots. How does that, as a teenager, how did that happen? Well, it was from two different influences. On the one hand, I, uh, my dad was a minister. I heard uh, in church one story about human beings. But then I was also learning to program. And uh, it was early days of programming. I was using paper tapes and punch cards and so forth. But but I got the idea. So I was start, starting to think about you know machine intelligence in a very concrete way. And then I began to to wonder also you know the sciences describe us as uh, the result of evolution and and uh, bio biochemical processes. And so I wanted to try to bring these two points of view together, or at least understand how they how they relate. And so that, that got me interested in, in the deep question, are we just machines or not? So that was the way I tried to precisely phrase the question so I could try to proceed and understand who we are. What does it mean to be a human being? When you start to think of machines, even at a young age, were you thinking of a machine as in the early computing technology? I mean, we're just at a much more advanced level. What type of machine were you imagining that we could possibly be. And then that opens up a, a further question, a follow on, which is if we were a machine, then it starts to get into consciousness and a whole slew of issues start to unfold. Well, by a machine, I was thinking of something that follows a system of rules. So the rules might have flexibility in the sense, for example, in a computer program, you can have a conditional statement. If this happens, then do that. But if that happens, then do the other. You can do decisions that are non-trivial and still be a machine. I had this notion of a rule-governed system under the laws of physics as my notion of machine. I wanted to, of course, cash that out in a little bit more detail, and we've been able, that has been done. Uh, so that was the notion of machine that I was after, not not just simply, you know, a kind of machine like, like uh, you know, a piece of hardware that you might have in your tool shed, but, but a, a fairly sophisticated machine that can do complex computations, complex decisions, can take information in, process that information, act intelligently, and yet still just be a program. I would be amiss in not to ask the follow-up, considering you stated that your dad was a minister. Yes. And if you're thinking about machines, obviously somebody has to make the machine. That would be the point of view from the religious side, that uh, even if we are machines, it, it was created 
by God. Of course, they wouldn't say that we were just machines. They would say that we're something far more than 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 just machines. And that was the question that I wanted to address. I mean, is there good scientific evidence that we are more than machines, or is there or is there not good scientific evidence? I wanted to address that. But of course, from a, a non-religious point of view, from a, a physicalist point of view, you could say that there would be no need for some creator to create the machines. It could simply be uh, a fact, you know, that there was a say a big bang almost 14 billion years ago, and there's just inanimate space, time, and matter, and through processes of chance, and, and then eventually, you know, net process of natural selection, we came to being. Those were the two big approaches to understanding what it means to be a human, and since I am a human, I had a, an interest in the, in the question. <laughs> this brings up a, an issue that's been topical these days, and I see quite a few physicists speaking to the issue you know, are, are we a simulation? Are we? Is the universe a simulation? Let's save that for the very end. If you've got a, if you've got a view on that, I'd be, I'd be curious. But I, I would love to open this up to what you've become very well known for, and you've got a great TED talk, some great writings out there. I think it really starts with, and maybe I think the foundation is. I mean, I'm looking around a living room and a kitchen area right now, and I'm. Visually, I can I can see certain things, or at least I, I think I'm seeing certain things. <laughs> that but that's speak to what's going on though when we open our eyes and we visualize and and maybe for the lay person out there, even the more experienced, try to connect the dots on a basic level as to how that the vision is working and what's going on in our perception. Explain some of that just on a base level before we even get into the the bigger picture uh, point that you are tearing apart. So the standard approach that you learn in a class on, you know, visual perception from, say, cognitive neuroscience perspective is that, uh, you know, there's a real 3D world out there, real space time with real 3D objects, and light bounces off those objects and passes through the lens of your eye, which focuses it on the back of your eye, where you have um, a piece of neural tissue called the retina. And the retina has about 120 million photoreceptors. It's like 120, 130 megapixel camera at the back of your eye and each of those photoreceptors catches photons of light and your eye does some sophisticated processing actually it's quite a sophisticated processor it's got hundreds of millions of interneurons doing all sorts of you know digital image processing techniques right in your eye and at the end of that there's a bunch of data compression and and so forth that goes on in there and out the back of your eye comes just one million axons. So you have a uh, 130 million photoreceptors in, only a million axons out. So that's you know 130 to 1 compression that's going on in the eye. So it's a very very sophisticated system. And then it's we you know the eye sends the data along this cable with a, a million fibers up to the occipital lobe of the brain through the, uh, the center of the brain called the thalamus. So it goes to the thalamus and then to the occipital lobe, and then it goes to about a third of your of your brain's cortex is involved in in the process of just opening your eyes and looking around the room. So it's it's that's the standard neuroscience story that that uh, you know photons hit the eye after they've bounced off of objects, they get processed in the eye, sent up to the brain, and then you have billions of neurons and trillions of synapses that do sophisticated computations to let you see the true world that you're in. If we think about vision right now, at least in vision in terms of uh, humanity, us, homo sapiens, we know there's been an evolutionary process to where, look, there was some news the other day, they found this uh, one millimeter type uh, creature from way back, you know, not billions of years ago that they think could have been the, the first one of us, at least the first part of the evolutionary chain. If I think about evolution, though, we have to, we have to, I guess the, the normal way of thinking about this would be like, okay, over time, our, our vision uh, perhaps has improved or it's become more accurate. And we, as, as the last ones standing right now in the, the human race, this accuracy or this, this better way for us to see or our better understanding of what we're seeing, that this has helped us to get to the point where we are today, that this, this increased vision is, is a huge aspect as to why we are what we are today. That's not really how you see it, though, is it? That's right, but you've nicely summarized what is the the standard view of most uh, experts in my field, in the field of cognitive neuroscience. They would say that perceptions that are closer to the truth, that are more accurate, 
The, the technical term they use is veridical. You know, vertical means that your perception is closer to what really is there around you. So perceptions that are more accurate or more veridical give you a competitive advantage compared to other organisms that have less vertical perceptions, less accurate perceptions. As a result, you're more likely to pass on your genes that code for those more accurate perceptions. And so after thousands of generations of this process, we can be pretty sure that we're the offspring of those who saw more accurately and so we see more accurately. So that's the the standard view and it actually, you know, it seems quite plausible. Very, very bright people in, in my field believe it. And I would say that the you know the average person who's not an expert would find it a very compelling argument. And I decided to to look at it more closely. It sure seems plausible, but before you explain the the difference and how you branched off, why did you even decide to pick this fight in your mind? Well, I began to develop, even as a graduate student, trying to develop a mathematically precise theory of perception that would cover all aspects of perception. You know, not just, you know, a particular perception. How do we see 3D from stereo? How do we see motion? How do we see color? I wanted a general theory that would really help me understand perception at its core. And as I looked at my mathematical theory, it began to bother me that Maybe we don't see reality. Maybe that theory was saying to me, we, we don't see reality as it is. And so that, when I realized that the math might be saying that to me, it was a, it was a bit confounding. It took me a long time, but I finally decided, that, you know, I better address that question that, that, that math was posing to me. And probably the best way to do it was through evolution. I was thinking about your big picture here, and I'm going to let you use some examples that you're comfortable with too. But I was thinking of the idea of what we perceive and, and those that can more accurately perceive perhaps have the, the evolutionary advantage. But then I, I, I took it and tell me if I'm completely crazy here and correct me, but if I was looking at modern day society and I could think of some of the more advanced countries, perhaps advanced in terms of education, wealth, sophistication. Uh, there's definitely differences in countries right now in modern times in 2017. And I, and I, I can also think about those countries in terms of birth rate. And, and often, it seems like, typically, the, the more advanced countries, the birth rates are, are, are dropping. And I start to wonder, well, you know, do they perceive too much information? And then I look at some of the growing countries that perhaps are not as sophisticated, and the birth rates are off the charts. And so you wonder, well, if you, you have to play that game forward, and I'm sure you've looked at the simulations on these types of things, and you're going to explain this. But in my own simple way of thinking, if I have to play that forward, if you have the much more advanced society today that sees supposedly so much clearer, but they've decided to have less kids. And then the society that doesn't see as clear is having a ton more kids. Well, who survives in the future? That's a great question. And it really brings out a key point about evolution. The key notion in evolution by natural selection is the notion of fitness. And fitness, it's very easy to get it wrong. We might think that fitness is the same thing as being stronger or being smarter or being, you know, more accurate in our perceptions. And it's none of those things. The only notion that's of value in evolution for fitness is, did you have more kids? That's the, that's the gold standard in evolution. Evolution doesn't really care about intelligence. It doesn't care about accurate perceptions. It doesn't care about uh, technological advances for their own sake. Only to the extent that they actually, uh, you know, advance the chance that you will have more kids will that, you know, the ability to do these things uh, be passed on to the next generation. So, for example, there's a, the very funny example of the, of the sea squirt. It is a sea creature that as a juvenile has a very sophisticated nervous system and it uses it to swim around and hunt for a place to, to lodge itself. It, it's going to, it, it's a filter feeder and it's going to find some place to, to attach itself that needs enough water flow, but not too much water flow with enough nutrients, but not too much. And once it attaches itself, it stays there for the rest of its life. But now, now that it's attached itself, it really doesn't need that sophisticated nervous system. And so it eats it. And that's what evolution thinks about, uh, intelligence and brains. If you don't need your brains, eat them. Evolution is not about being more intelligent. It's not about being stronger. It's literally about having kids. And our own species, people might be surprised to learn, is losing its brains. We, Our brains were the biggest about 20,000 years ago, and our brains are in free fall. We are losing 
brain size, brain volume, even compared to our body size. The so-called encephalization quotient, the ratio of brain to body size, is dropping dramatically. We've lost the volume of a tennis ball in only 20,000 years. That's, that's free fall. So evolution really doesn't care about big brains or intelligence. It, it only cares about uh, how many kids you have. You know, I was taking this further in my own mind. I was thinking, again, like modern society and uh, more sophisticated, wealthy type uh, societies. And the male, uh, me being one of them, uh, maybe, maybe we all get, um, we get fixated on, perhaps if we're heterosexual, we get fixated on the, the idea of the most attractive woman. I must find the most attractive woman. But then again, if you kind of put that aside and you go to a more developing country, that's not the focus. Just it's the focus is female, male. It's not only so in the, and I look at the more advanced societies where they can spend so much time, so much energy, never to find the supermodel, uh, you know, uh, baby partner, but on the less sophisticated places that perhaps don't care about as much of that level of detail, aren't taking in that level of detail. They're just like, Hey, male, female, let's have kids. Right. And this brings up another very interesting aspect about evolution. There's more than one way to be fit. There are different what they call strategies in evolution. So one strategy might be, for example, to be very, very picky about your mate, have very few kids, but put a lot of investment in each one of those kids. Then you have a good chance of having healthy, a few healthy kids that actually survive uh, long enough that they can reproduce. But another strategy that could work is to, uh, you know, not really be that discriminating and put even no investment in your kids at all. So you have dozens of kids, most of them die, but if, you know, a few of them don't, then you might be as fit or even more fit than the person who just had a couple kids and put all their eggs in that basket. If from the point of view of evolution, those are two, you no, know, those are two extreme strategies, but there's all sorts of strategies in between. So there's this whole set of strategies and there's no one single strategy that's the right way to do it. It's, it's a matter of what are the other strategies you're competing with and how well do they all succeed when they compete with each other? Let me take this into uh, another derivative of of your uh, your work. I think the really interesting uh, that the whole evolutionary conversation, how one sees reality, uh, and talking about fitness is extremely. I mean, for curious people, just wow, that's really cool. But there's another deeper layer and level that starts to come come through in your work. Do we see reality as is? I mean, right now I'm sitting here and I'm looking in my hand a bottle of green tea. Uh, made by the company Ituin. It has uh, Japanese characters all over it. It looks green. It seems to have fall leafy foliage as part of the icon on it. It says 525 milliliters. I'm holding it in my hand. It's kind of halfway empty. It feels, it feels cold. I could, I, I think it's here, but after going through your world, I'm not really sure if it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I would say that. Almost all of us have a deep belief that we see the world pretty much the way it is. I see an apple in front of me or a cup of green tea or, or a bottle of tea. I, I assume that I'm not seeing, of course, the whole truth. No one believes we see all of the truth. But that what I am seeing is, is true and it's, it's the truth that I need. That was the question that I began to, to ask. Is that right? Are, are we correct in thinking that our perceptions shaped by evolution would give us truths, not all the truth, but some truths about the world around us? And so it turns out we don't have to rely on just our intuitions anymore. The theory of evolution by natural selection is a mathematically precise theory. There's something called evolutionary game theory and evolutionary graph theory and also genetic algorithms. So we can actually address this with mathematical rigor. And so I, I did that with a couple of graduate students, Justin Mark and Brian Merriam. We began to do Monte Carlo simulations, and it it turned out that uh, organisms that, uh, we, so we could play God. We would create hundreds of thousands of, of randomly chosen worlds and put creatures in these worlds that could see all of the truth of the world, or some of the truth, or none of the truth, but were just tuned to fitness functions. We, we tried a variety of fitness functions. 
And what we were finding in these simulations is, was that organisms that, that saw the truth just went extinct when they competed against organisms that saw none of the truth and were just tuned to fitness. Even if those organisms that saw none of the truth were a lot simpler, that they didn't have nearly as many resources as the organisms that saw the truth. Simulations are, are nice. They gave me some confidence that we were on to something, but one can, of course, object that, uh, you know, maybe you missed the world that was the critical world or you didn't get the right fitness function or whatever, you know. Maybe you were biased somehow in the simulations that you chose. So I conjectured a theorem. And then I worked uh, with the mathematician Chaitan Prakash, uh, and he proved the theorem. The theorem is quite clear. If our perceptual systems evolve by natural selection, then the chance that we see any aspect of reality, as it is, is zero. So that's that forces a dilemma. Evolution by natural selection is one of our uh, most strongly uh, confirmed scientific theories. And so that, that theory entails that uh, we track our perceptions, track fitness, and by tracking fitness, we almost surely never track the truth. And that, that was kind of, I don't know if I made it as clear in my curious type question in the beginning. That's why I was comparing the two different cultures, the advanced and the not so advanced, because it, it maybe one, the, the higher one had more truth, but the more truth was not necessarily advantageous in an evolutionary uh, manner. We would like to think in, in the more advanced cultures that, that uh, we're seeing deeper into the nature of truth. We certainly have better stuff. But the question is, having better stuff, like sending rockets to Mars, does that mean that because we can do more stuff and do it better, that we actually have more insight into truth? And it turns out it doesn't have to be that way. So you, you might ask, you know, well, then if, if we're getting better, like our, our stuff is better, we can do more technologically advanced stuff, how is that possible if we're not seeing the truth? And how is it possible that our perceptions can be useful if they're not true? So I think that there is, you know, a metaphor that can really help our intuitions here because, I mean, I'm like everybody else. I feel like if our perceptions aren't true, then what good are they? They, they If they aren't true, they're, they're useless. But there's a metaphor that will help around that. Think about your desktop interface on your, on your computer. And suppose you're writing an email. And, and the file for the, you know, the email that you're writing is a file on the computer, but the, the icon on your desktop is, say, a, a blue rectangular icon in the middle of your desktop. Does that mean that the file itself in the computer is blue and rectangular and in the middle of the computer? Well, of course not. I mean, no one ever would be fooled to think that the color of the icon is the color of the file. In fact, the email doesn't have a color. And the, the shape of the icon is not the shape of the email. In fact, the email really doesn't have a shape. Uh, and, and the position of the icon on the desktop is surely not the position of the email. You know, all of the voltages and magnetic fields that make up that email, they, there's no one position that they've got. The idea is that the desktop interface has eye candy, like icons on the desktop. It's an illusion. It's an illusion, but it's it's not there to fool you. No one is really fooled. It's there to hide the truth, right? It's there to hide the diodes and resistors and magnetic fields and voltages. Um, because if you had to toggle voltages, you'd never write your email. Your friend would never hear from you. So it's there to hide the truth and give you the eye candy you need to get the stuff done. And that's the, the idea of the interface. It let it By hiding the truth, it, it gives you tools that let you interact with the truth, even though you're ignorant, completely ignorant of the truth. Most of us have no idea how a computer uh, really works or what it's really like on the inside. These examples of hiding the truth, though, across the spectrum are just everywhere when you start to look closely, aren't they? Absolutely. It's not just vision. It's in all of our senses. It's very interesting. There's good evolutionary arguments that we even deceive ourselves about ourselves. We're completely self-deceived about our own motives and so forth. But in this case, this is not so much about deception. It's that evolution shaped us with perceptual systems that give us what we need to stay alive. And we don't need the truth. And so we don't have the truth. We have eye candy. So, so that to put it very, very concretely, space, as you perceive it in 3D, 
is your desktop. Physical objects like apples and cars and bottles of tea are icons in your 3D desktop. None of it's true. None of it exists independent of you. It's just your desktop, uh, a species-specific, homo sapiens-specific kind of interface that we evolved to keep us alive uh, and not to show us the truth. In fact, opposite, to hide the truth from us. And I've seen other people do this with you. A little pushback in the sense sure. that if I walk outside right now and I generally I'm in I'm in Saigon, so it's kind of safe to walk amongst the millions of motorbikes. They won't try to kill me. But I do know, <laughs> I do know that the bus drivers really don't care. And if I if I walk outside and I get in front of a bus that is going a certain speed, I'm over. So that seems it seems like my perception is telling me, I mean, there's some experience there too. My perception is saying that bus is coming too fast. It's of a certain size. If I walk in front of it and, you know, somebody and somebody could say the, the elephant charging or the train or whatever, this is where it gets complicated, in my opinion, and trying to, trying to wrap my arms around everything is because that, se- that, that threat seems, my perception, my eyeballs are saying that threat is real and I know I'm going to die if I take that step. That's right. We have to take our perceptions very seriously. And the threats are real. The threats are, are should be taken seriously. But to take something seriously doesn't entail that you have to take it literally. So, for example, to be very concrete, going back to the icon on your desktop, uh, I would I would not carelessly drag that blue rectangular icon to the trash can. Not because I take the icon literally, it's not literally blue or rectangular, but I do take it seriously. If I drag that icon to the trash can, I could lose all of my work. There's a key distinction. We, We have to take our perceptions seriously. Evolution, in fact, gave us the symbols it did to keep us alive. So we have to take them seriously. You know, if you see a, a bus coming down a road in Saigon right at you, then you better step out of the way. Not because it's literally true that there's a 3D world and a bus, but those are the symbols that evolution has given you that, that tell you what to do right now. You don't know what the truth is, but you know that uh, what you need to do in spite of the fact that you don't know the truth. It's much like if you're playing a video game. If you're playing a video game and some horrible thing is about to happen to you, you can get out of the way because you can see in the 3D world of the video game uh, what, you know, that say you're, you're playing Grand Theft Auto or something like that and some black chopper is coming at you. Uh, well, so you can, you, you can, you know, avoid it. You try to avoid getting, you know, taken out by that chopper. It's not that there's really, a, no one actually believes that inside your computer there's really a chopper or that you're really driving a red Ferrari, even though it looks like you're driving a, you know, driving a red Ferrari. It's, it's all the icon on your, icons on your desktop, but they're a nice guide to what's happening inside the computer that you're completely ignorant about and what you need to do to stay alive and get to the next level of the game. Is a way to think about this, the matter that we see is in our consciousness. It's not necessarily there. That's right. Yeah, the idea is that we construct our perceptions of space-time and objects on the fly. So I, I look over and I see an apple, so I'm constructing that apple. I look away, and I'm no longer constructing that apple, and so that apple no longer exists. There is something that exists, but it's nothing in space and time. Whatever that something is, so solipsism is, is a weird idea that there, you know, I'm the only thing in the universe and nothing exists except me and my perceptions. I'm not a solipsist, and, and not too many people are. So I think there is something out there. I'm questioning whether... It has anything to do with space and time and physical objects. And I'm saying, if you buy evolution, then the chance is zero that it has anything to do with space, time, and physical objects. So there's something out there. And when I look over and I see an apple, what's really happening is I'm constructing a symbol. I call it an apple. And that symbol is a representation to me of certain fitness payoffs that I could get if I take certain actions. The shape of the apple tells me how I might grab it. The color of the apple tells me whether it's perhaps ripe and and edible. If it looks rotten, I know I probably shouldn't. And I can take a bite and eat it and get fitness points that way. So an apple is a symbol 
It's not an existent reality independent of me. It's a symbol that I create on the fly to tell me how to get the fitness points I need to stay alive. Separating the observed from the observer. This is, this is the trick here, it seems. You've put yourself, and I would love for you to kind of expand on this too. You've, you've talked about working with colleagues and you know, the, the, the youthful uh, thought process and, and the experimentation as an adult, but you've put yourself in a position where you, you seem very comfortable separating yourself from yourself. I think it's very difficult for most people, isn't it? In what sense do you think about separating the self from the self here? Well, I can observe. I can observe this green tea. What you're painting a picture of is to imagine what would be there if I wasn't looking at it. So if I wasn't using all of my evolutionary visionary process to see this, what would be there if I wasn't observing it? Ah, uh, yes. That's right. If I claim that space-time is not objective reality, and physical objects are not objective reality, but that there is some objective reality, it's up to me, you know, it, the burden is on me to at least try to come up with a theory about what that reality might be. So I've been looking at that problem. I've been constrained by this, by one idea, and that is, I may not know anything. And it's quite possible that I that I know nothing, that, that everything I believe is, is utterly false. That, that's certainly possible. But But if I know anything at all, I know that I have conscious experiences. I have the experience of the taste of chocolate, or the smell of garlic, or the feeling of pain, feeling of love, and, and so forth, uh, the sound of a trumpet. So if I'm wrong about those things, and, and, and I'm not claiming that I know that I'm not wrong, but I, I, I might be wrong, but, but if I'm wrong about having conscious experiences, then I might as well just give up, you know, just have a beer and just have fun because you know, there's there's no chance of doing any science at all. I mean, I'm, I'm wrong about everything. So, given that, given that I think I have conscious experiences, and and I've used evolutionary theory to show that this objective physical world that we thought was real isn't the truth, how can I go about trying to get a theory of reality that that allows me to talk about my conscious experiences and about my brain because I do, you know, when I look inside of a head, we, we, we see brains. So I decided to try to come up with a theory in which I, I have a mathematical model of consciousness. So, so not just a hand wave, you know, we can talk about consciousness and religions have talked about consciousness for thousands of years. What I'm trying to do that's different is to say, here is a precise mathematical structure that I claim captures every feature of consciousness and all of its dynamics. Now, I'm probably wrong, but I'm trying to be precise so that people can point out why I'm wrong, and then we can precisely fix where I'm precisely wrong. So, so my goal, so I'm not claiming to be right, but what I'm claiming to be is precise so that, and I've got a mathematically precise theory of consciousness that I've published, and the idea then, and, and the, the, the approach I'm taking is to say, consciousness is fundamental. It is the nature of objective reality. Here's my mathematical definition of consciousness. Now the burden on me is to show how I can get what we call the physical world to arise from the mathematical model of consciousness. How do I get quantum theory, Einstein's theory of gravity, and maybe even their union, you know, quantum gravity, to come out of this theory of consciousness? And that's what I'm working on with colleagues right now. Well, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation that some of your colleagues, perhaps many, uh, would disagree with you. But I guess what you just described would be more to point out, hey, there's some holes here. I'm setting down what I believe to be precise. Now, come with me and help me to take this further along. But as you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, some don't want to go there. So you've obviously opened up a can of worms where there's ripe room for study. So what is the what is some of the conflict? What are the, the peer conflict or critique where they don't perhaps want to go with you to further explore in the direction that you're going? A lot of my colleagues, when I first bring up this idea, they're so convinced, as most of us are, that uh, of course we see reality as it is, that they at first think I'm not serious. But then when I start to go through the evolutionary arguments, 
then then it comes down to okay that's uh, if it's wrong it's not obviously wrong the 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 quick rejoinders about you know, how it might be wrong don't work so uh, which doesn't prove that i'm right but it just proves that if i'm wrong uh, we're going to have to dig a little bit deeper into it. So some of my colleagues uh, in print have proposed, they've actually looked at the, the mathematics in more detail and tried to come up with reasons why it might might be wrong, and I've been able to reply to all of them also in print. So there's nothing yet that has stuck. This is the normal give and take in, in science, and that's what I love about science is that the whole point of science and, and what's unique about it as a human endeavor is that instead of trying to make your theory vague enough that no one can show you wrong, we do the opposite. We try to make our theories and claims so precise that people can take clean shots and show you where you're wrong. It's not about authorities. And it's not about being vague and hand wavy so that no one can, you know, take you down. It's about putting a clean target for everybody to, everybody to take pot shots at. That's how we make progress. That's what I've I've been up to with the evolutionary work. I, I've said pre here's precisely why, uh, you know, here here's our theorem. Is there something wrong in the assumptions of the theorem? The theorem itself is either the proof is correct. No one's been able to find a, a you know, problem with the proof. So the only gambit is to say that. Certain assumptions are wrong, yeah. uh, but they're standard assumptions of evolutionary theory. And the same thing with my theory of consciousness, right? I'm being precise. Someone can say, well, there's this property of consciousness that you haven't captured, and then we can have a productive scientific discussion. Before I got on the call with you, I was thinking about past societies and putting myself into your work's lens. And I was thinking perhaps, for example, uh, Roman society or Egyptian society back in the day, several thousand years ago. You start to wonder, just like some of the more advanced societies today, did they get to the point where they had all the money, they had all the wealth, they had more information, they could take in more information, they were more accurate in their understanding, but the developing group that didn't have all what they had uh, just kept making babies. And eventually, the higher society, I just wonder if this has been going on uh, throughout, throughout time where we basically just keep reloading and it's actually not this progressive, you know, keep passing along where, where in many ways, it's, it's as you say, look, this can go in many different ways. It doesn't necessarily go one precise way, but it, this thinking about past civilizations that didn't make it, the way you posit your thought process makes me go, oh, wow, oh, wow. Mm. Well, that's a, a, a very good point, and it applies to our species and, in fact, to all species. It's, it's a sobering fact that of all the species that have been on this planet, more than 99% are extinct. It's, it's species come and go. Different strategies are tried and discarded. Even within our species, there are multiple different strategies that are tried and discarded. And even our own perceptual systems right now are undergoing tremendous evolution. I, I think that, that there are people that are called synesthetics. They, they see differently than the rest of us. Where we see a color, they might also hear a sound. Or where they have a taste, they might also feel a touch. But I think we can think of these synesthetics, and they're about 4% of the population. This is evolution mutating our interface and trying out new new versions of our desktop interface and maybe a new version will be the the, the new one that that spreads throughout our population and takes over but what's what's really interesting about this as well along the point that you raised is that it's a fact about evolution that as soon as you have four or more strategies interacting that you have the possibility of, of chaotic dynamics and what that means is that it's essentially unpredictable you, you make a tiny little change in the current situation, and how it plays out, you can't predict at all. That's what happens. Of course, we have far more than four strategies. We have dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions of strategies. So this is an entirely chaotic process. Who knows how, we'll, how it will play out? Um, <laughs> we're lucky to be here right now. I think if we all go back, if we, like I mentioned at the very beginning, they just found this millimeter-sized uh, beast in China. I think if we had to go back and play the game over, so to speak, and just let things evolve, it wouldn't evolve like it did i mean it, it this is a one-off it doesn't keep it's there's no guarantee it would be repeated as it happened 
Uh, you could probably guarantee that it wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, you know, the chance that, that this thing that would happen again is, is pretty much zero. And one story about us is that when that that huge meteor hit the Yucatan uh, 65 million years ago, uh, it opened up a niche for mammals uh, that if it hadn't opened up, we probably wouldn't be here. So it's, you know, we're lucky that a meteor hit. The dinosaurs were unlucky, but we are lucky. That changed fortunes. <laughs> I think most people, when they probably chat with you, and I'm sure you love it because this is your career and, and what your passion is, but we can go in literally directions for hours, days, weeks, months, years for the rest of your life. I want to take you to something, though, that has been in a topical discussion, and I mentioned it at the top, which is the notion, and I've seen several very well-known physicists talk about this, the idea that, and you've been mentioning the math, that perhaps everything is a simulation, and perhaps we are living in a simulation. We are part of the simulation, which could mean that there is a simulator. I mean, I, I, I told people, I said, I think back to the Twilight Zone episode, and there's a couple running around a small town, and they can't find anybody. And they're just, like, getting nervous, and there's, like, weird sounds, and they're, the whole episode's this. And then at the end, they look, look up. All, all of a sudden, this big hand comes down. This hand picks up the the couple, and then the it's a little girl. Little girl's holding the couple, and and the, and the mother walks in and says, "Hey, you know, don't hurt those Earthlings that your father brought back, you know, for you from uh, you know, from his travels." And and you know, I guess when people start to say that uh, we could be in the middle of a simulation, it raises that very issue, doesn't it? It it really does, and there's some surprising things we've learned from physics that do line up with the idea of a simulation. So, for example, if you look really closely at your computer, take out a magnifying glass and look really closely at your desktop uh, screen of your computer, you'll see that there's tiny little pixels. That is not a, a smooth, continuous surface. There are little dots. And it turns out when you look at our space-time, the, you know, the thing that we think is objective reality, when you look really, really closely, it turns out there's pixels. There is a smallest patch of space-time. It's not continuous all the way down. And beyond that, we don't. Be, you, you, space-time doesn't even make sense when you go to links smaller than what's called the Planck scale. So we have pixels, which is really surprising. And another thing, uh, if you have a, a virtual world with a virtual 3D space, you really can't store any information in that virtual 3D space, right? So if I show you a visual illusion, for example, there's a famous illusion of so-called Necker cube. It's a little line drawing that anybody can do really quickly, and it, you just draw a few lines, but it looks like a 3D cube. The three, the three dimensions that you see, of course, are an illusion, and you couldn't store any information in it because it's all illusory. Well, it turns out what we call real objective space is the same way. The amount of information that you can store in a volume of space, like, say, take a volleyball. So you have a, a volleyball sphere. How much information can you store in that volleyball? It turns out it's the volume of the volleyball is utterly irrelevant. It has nothing to do with how much information you can store. It's the surface area of the volleyball. And if you start to wrap your head around that fact, so I'm not pulling your leg, the volume of the volleyball has nothing to do with how much information you can store in it. It's the surface area. And what that means, for example, suppose I got six smaller balls that I could just fit inside that volleyball. It turns out if you do the math, those six smaller volleyballs that just fit inside, they have about half the volume of the bigger volleyball. But they have a, a little bit more surface area, about 3% more surface area. So you can actually store more information in those three little, uh, no, I'm sorry, in those six little balls than in the bigger volleyball. And if you keep doing that recursively, take each one of those little balls and pack six ones into it and so forth, you eventually get to the point where there's essentially no volume and you can store tremendous amount of information. That's the universe we live in. It's so different from what our intuitions are that the idea that uh, it's a simulation and perhaps that it's a simulation of consciousness is something that we have to at least look into. It will cause anybody to pause that hasn't already paused because this is, this is what we should be. We should be on this path. We should be on the path that if we see a discrepancy, if we see a hole in the theory, we should want to go down that path. I think too often there are groups 
of people, individuals, larger groups. They're just afraid. They don't want to go down the path. And I, I, I applaud people like yourself that are taking it to the literal edge to try and get us all to say, my God, here, there's a hole here. There's, there's, a, there's, some, there's some rough edge here. We haven't talked about this. We need to think deeper here. We need to explore this. We should not just ignore this. Yes, and, and I would say that this, um, in the area of the sciences, what I'm doing is not unusual. This is, in some sense, how science works. A scientist takes the, the current theories that are the best theories and pushes them to their limits. We try, that. this is sort of what we do as scientists. We try to take our best theories, like Einstein's theories and quantum mechanics and so forth, and we push them as hard as we can until we break them. And when we break them, then we're happy. Because once you break your best theory, that is the time when you can start to learn, when you can make new advances in the science. And so what I'm trying to do is what scientists normally try to do, break our theories so we can make advances. Hey, look, we're going to find out one day, and maybe we'll never know everything by any stretch of the imagination, but I would hazard a guess, and I'm sure you would too, that the reality that we currently understand is probably going to be far, far, far different than the steps and the, what is revealed in the future. We, we, we will find that we, we, we just didn't know anything. Uh, I, I think that that's pretty much right. I, my idea about how much I know has gone way, way down. <laughs> Things <laughs> I was sure of, uh, I'm not sure of now. And, and I find that, I mean, I, it, it can be unsettling, but I find it curiously fun to, to not know. And to to explore, it's a mind opening experience. It, I, I don't give up. I'm I'm going to keep trying, even though I know it's quite possible from an evolutionary point of view that I might not be equipped with the concepts I needed. We don't expect that monkeys have the concepts to understand quantum mechanics. A monkey can't understand Mozart. It quite it's quite possible that Homo sapiens didn't evolve the concepts that are needed to understand reality as it is, but. I'm going to go down trying. <laughs> well, I think the fact that you raised that question is the most important because it's basically saying, do we, you know, can we, do we, do we have it in us to figure this out or do we just not have the capacity? And then that raises, that raises the other issue that just, again, what you've been saying throughout this whole conversation is that the reality that we understand is just most likely very, very different from perhaps the real reality. <laughs> that's, I don't know if that's a phrase we should be using, the real reality, because who, who knows what the real reality is and never be if we'll ever know. But. That, that, that's right. Uh, I, I agree with you. And, and what's interesting, though, is that even though we don't know what the real reality is, what we can do and what we, what we proved was if evolution by natural selection is correct, then we don't know that real reality. <laughs> <laughs> Don, it's been good chatting. Where can we send everybody? They're gonna have everyone's gonna have to go check your TED talk out and read some of your work because this really does require a sit down in a quiet area and to really think deeply. It doesn't necessarily jump out off the paper at you. You really have to say, okay, hold on. Are, are you saying that? <laughs> it's it's <laughs> yes. It's 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 good for uh, you know. A beer and a time to relax. <laughs> um, yeah, they can go to my website, uh, Donald Hoffman. If you do, just go Google Donald Hoffman, H-O-F-F-M-A-N. Uh, my my website has links to a lot of this stuff. My Vita has uh, actually links to free free um, online publications and and interviews and videos and so forth. And one of the best, most accessible sources was an interview by Amanda Gefter in the Atlantic. It's called The Case Against Reality, and I think she did a really good job of, of exposing these ideas in a way that might make them easier to grasp than, than most. Yeah, yeah, it's a great article. I did I, that's, that's actually that's how I found you. I appreciate you coming on, and uh, thank you for opening up your world to my audience. Thank you very much, Michael. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. 
To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.